I have been using the Canon PTZ cameras and they are fantastic. I've now used both the $2,000 and $5,000 Canon PTZ controllers. And I like both of them, but I also know the community and saving even $1,000 is a big deal if you are a church. In other videos, I've looked at using a Stream Deck to save money by controlling these cameras. And that is a great option, but requires a bit of understanding of BitFocus Companion just to kind of keep things running smoothly. Now, I wanna look at some other free network control methods that are available and ship with this equipment. No, I'm not talking about the remote control that ships with the cameras, but if that fits your workflow, then absolutely go for it. We will be looking at the viability of using the web page and the camera control application as a controller to run these cameras. If we have not met, my name is Nathan from Crazy Amazing Designs. My goal is to train and educate leaders like you to do church and event production with excellence. So if that sounds interesting, please go ahead and subscribe and like this video to see more videos in the future on topics like this. Once these cameras are connected to the network, the web page can be accessed, which allows for control of all aspects of these cameras. The one limitation of the web page is the ability to control multiple cameras, which is where the controllers, or in this case, the camera control application comes in. So we're gonna start right there. To download this software, go to Canon's website, and on the products page for any of their PTZ cameras, scroll all the way to the bottom, we're looking for the product support section. And because this program works with any of the Canon PTZ cameras, it should show up under the product page of any of these PTZ cameras. Now I'll click software and drivers. So it's detected my operating system, which is Mac. And then I'm gonna click on this version of the operating system I have. And now I can go ahead right here and download the remote camera control application. So. I already have that downloaded, so I'll swipe over to my applications folder and then click remote camera control application. So here we are. So I'm gonna go ahead in the top left and click on the uh, pop out. And now I can click on camera management and I'll click add in the top right. So now I'm gonna go ahead and search my cameras. So it looks like it found the CRN 500. Let's see if we can get the 700 online. Okay, the 700 is coming online. I had it plugged into the wrong ethernet port, so it needs 60 watts of power, and the other one only needs 30, so I had it plugged in the wrong one. Okay, now if I go ahead and search again, I can see both cameras. They both have IP addresses, and I can go ahead and click on the first one. So I'll start with the N500, click OK, and I'm gonna go ahead and give it a name, N500, and now I'm going to I can either connect as a guest user or I can give it the username and password. If I wanna have control of the camera, I need to give it the log, the password so that it can access, the software can access the camera and get all the functions it needs to do. So I'll just give it the password. Okay, and now I'll go ahead and click connect. So now it'll go ahead and connect to the camera. So I'm gonna go ahead and add another camera, which is I'm gonna search cameras and it's only gonna find one more, the N700. So I'll go ahead and give it a name and 700 and then I'll do the same thing. I'll type in the password and if we don't give it the password, kind of like on the controller when we're trying to flip the image over, it's not gonna be able to do some functionality like the image flipping thing. So cool, now I can go ahead and close that. If I need to, I can export and import cameras. So I can go ahead, let me go ahead and export this camera list. Um, let's do all of this stuff and we'll be able to show what happens. I'm gonna save this on my desktop. And now if I import it, I can just import a list of things. So I'll go ahead and close that. So now on the left side here in my camera list, so this program can control up to 20 cameras. So if I click on the settings for the first one, it'll open up the web page, allow us to control the different functionalities. And I'm gonna go ahead and move these cameras over to these boxes. So I can just use this button to bring the camera feed over and use the second button to bring the second camera feed over. I could have a three by three grid on this page, but I only have two cameras connected, so that's not really gonna do us much good. So the options of what we can do inside of this is we can see the camera settings. Uh, we know what, what the settings are. We can click on the camera. If I click the number on the top left, and now on the right side, I've got a ton of features and things that I can control inside of the camera. Starting at the top of the application here on the basic tab, I can start with the focus. So it's currently on autofocus, but I can turn off the autofocus, which is kind of helpful if you have something that just won't focus properly, maybe your pastor, uh, and then you just want to be able to move around without the camera accidentally focusing on something else. 
Uh, you can use the one shot autofocus feature once the autofocus is off. And in fact, if you turn it on and you click one shot autofocus, it's gonna focus on whatever's going on and then it's gonna make it, turn it into a manual focus. So now you can manually adjust the focus near and far and there's different speed settings. You can also change the pan tilt speed. You can also change the zoom speed from these sliders here. And speaking of panning and tilting, I can go ahead and tilt down, tilt up, pan left, pan right, and then up, you know, up to the left, top, up left, up right, down left, all those things. You can also zoom in and zoom out. I don't know that I recommend following Taco, my fish, <laughs> with the on, with this application, but you know, it could be kind of cool in the right context. And you can also see the camera list on the left will update the picture to show what the framing is currently. It's not like a super fast update, but it updates every few seconds or so. Okay, and I can zoom back out and look at Taco's entire tank. So let's take a look down lower. Uh, on the presets, we can see the different presets. Speed specification. So I can set the time that it takes the presets to go from one preset to the next. So basically the time, the transition time between whatever we're at now and when I click on this preset, how long it takes to go to that position. So you can nudge it up and down. You can also just change the speed if you don't, if you just wanna use zero to 100% instead of time in seconds. You can also turn that off and then it'll just kinda rapidly go to the next section. But if you wanna, one of the best parts of these cameras is that you can live zoom in to a preset position and you don't have to just use them as a preset camera. But if, you know, every situation is different. A neat feature, you can freeze image during movement just to make sure that you, your last available image always stays there, which is really neat. So if I go ahead and freeze image during movement, you can see that I can zoom in and I can pan left. But then when I click on this preset, it's going to move the camera and then it's gonna cut there, which is really cool. That's a really neat feature. Freeze image during movement, I really like that. Okay, so there's several pages of presets. You can have a lot of those presets going on. Let's go down to the next setting, which is exposure. You can see all these automatic settings for exposure. I like to use manual on my cameras, but I used to use P all the time because it was like a little bit manual and a lot, oh, I think it's, automatic everything except ISO, so you can adjust your exposure settings automatically, and then you can do some of the stuff manually. AE shift is auto exposure, and then you can adjust the shift of that. So if I bring it up, let's see, it makes it nice and bright, and if I bring it down, it makes it nice and dark. Uh, we can also change the shutter mode, so we can do like shutter speed, shutter angle, clear scan, and clear scan, I never thought of that as a, uh, anyways. So I like monitors, have a scan thing. Different situations allow or demand different types of things. I would keep mine at shutter speed because it's something I understand. Your shutter speed of video should be double your frame rate. So if you're shooting at 30 frames a second, you put it at 60. Okay, uh, let's get down to gain. So we can automatically gain up and down the image. We can automatically set the iris based on what we got going on here. I would try to keep the iris as low as possible. That's what I do for my camera. The f-stop always stays as low as possible to get a nice shallow depth of field. But if you want more, if you have too much light, you can turn it up and it'll get rid of some of the light if you don't have an ND filter, for example. But these have built-in ND filters as we're gonna find out next. So you can turn them on. And if I go ahead and record, so I'm recording the output of the camera right now. Let me go ahead and zoom out a bit so we can see I'm gonna change the zoom speed to make it higher. And now pan over to see Taco's full tank. Okay, now I'll go back down to the ND filter settings. Why are we so dark? Let me turn the gain up. Let me turn it to auto iris just so I can deal with it. And then let's turn the ND filter. <laughs> so it's gonna start adjusting the gain to compensate. So let's turn that off. And then turn this 116. You can see it shuttering past. So, and let's see if I can actually turn, if I turn, the gain back to auto, will it actually, yeah, it's super grainy though. You see how grainy it is? That's because it's fighting through all that, and all those ND filters. So I'll go ahead and turn that off and I'll turn the gain back on, the automatic gain back on just to make sure it's good. Okay, so white balance settings are here. So if we click on the mode, we can adjust the, basically we can go from a bunch of different preset positions for the white balance 
to manual color temperature. So I have it set at 4300, but we could bring it down and make it super cool or super warm. So I'll just leave it at 4300, which I thought looked good for my office here. CC, oh, that must be a, like a tint. I'm not familiar with CC as a term, but we'll go with tint. Okay, cool. And then the tracing settings are down below, but they're grayed out currently. Let's go to details. And now we can see a bunch more settings here. Uh, we've got some more white balance settings, white balance uh, to specifically shift the red gain and the blue gain of the image. I'm just gonna leave those at zero because it looks just fine. Uh, but if you're trying to match these more specifically with other cameras, those settings might be familiar to you and valuable to you. Uh, let's adjust the sharpness level. You can see here that the image gets super sharp or it gets super soft. We'll just leave it at zero and be happy with that. Uh, sharpness limit, again, these are settings that you might need to adjust if you're trying to really dial in a camera to a different thing. So all of the gammas, all these different ranges, all these different points, I'm not super familiar with all of those. I use the basic color correction page in Premiere Pro. <laughs> yeah, anyways, um, knee, all the saturation bits. Let's go down, the, the focus is grayed out, the exposure is grayed out. The recording media is grayed out. This was actually something that I was hoping to use on these cameras, but it turns out the PTZs do not support recording video directly to an SD card. This uh, micro SD card or regular SD card slot is designed for saving internal camera configurations. I actually found this support article and someone was asking, what's going on here? Someone else pointed out that the reason this actually even exists on the camera control application is because you can connect other cameras to this and control them, cameras that actually do have the capability to record internally so that's really kind of a bummer but who knows maybe they'll add this in the future but also maybe not yes yeah, so you can take things away and add things to the section if you want specific things to be seen like let's say white balance you need to see so maybe you just wanted to see white balance and recording media you could have just those available but I'm just gonna have everything available the last section is the add-on section which is the auto tracking and different things I can activate the auto tracking I can set the sensitivity of the auto of the tracking I can set the uh, size. I'm guessing this would mean like the amount of people or the zoom distance of the auto tracking. Might be worth messing with in the future, those settings. And then we can uh, move it just to kind of uh, help out the auto tracking. Okay, and that's those four settings on that page. We can go ahead and get rid of that side window. I can go ahead and select the other camera. I can, let's go back to this camera and then bring this back out and then turn off the auto tracking and we'll save that. And then I'll just slide that back out of the way. And I can select both cameras, go back to the basic tab, go to the top and I can move both cameras at the same time, which is really cool. Uh, being able to do that sometimes I imagine would be neat. So I can unselect both cameras and now I can't control anything because everything's grayed out. There's, so there's a ton of functionality in this software. That should be basically everything that I've covered inside of here. Let's go back to the menu option and we've already used the camera management page. So we'll close out of that and then we'll go to camera power. So I can stand by, I can turn the power on, on and off on the cameras. I can click on the recording media but I still can't start and stop recordings. I can op, uh, click on the options. So I can do a bunch of keyboard shortcuts on the computer to adjust things how I like them. I can input a joystick data right here, which is neat. And I can also adjust the directions of different things. And I can, uh, some custom view settings. So I can see the audio level indicator I imagine on the screen. So yeah, that's pretty much the software uh, maintenance. We can export this, but we already did that. And we can also see some more information about the version of the software and things like that. So one of the things that we did was I clicked on the settings tab and it took me to the browser. So now on the browser, I can control all of the settings of the camera as well. So if you don't have that program on your computer, you can always use a browser, but then you have to have a bunch of tabs open. So it's really nice to be able to control at least up to 20 cameras from that control uh, program. So some of the settings though on here are really nice to be able to adjust, but literally all the same settings are available for this camera on the browser. So it's definitely worth uh, messing with the browser and you can change things like the digital uh, zoom. You can make sure that you can zoom in further to get the, up to 300X. I can set presets here. 
go ahead and select uh, preset position three, go ahead and click add. I can change the name to taco wide shot and I can save all the different settings. I can save the speed level at which it goes to that and I can tell it to update the thumbnail. So I'll click add and now it will update that and save the preset position for taco. And now I can set the time that I want it to take to get to that angle or I can click on another camera and I can execute that other preset position and now it'll start zooming into that other preset position. This was during an event we did on Sunday. I was using other cameras. So uh, obviously these aren't in this room, so I'm not gonna be able to zoom into that framing, but it's really cool to be able to see what kind of framing you would get if you were able to zoom into that. Click on the settings here and it's wanting me to log in. And go ahead and enter my password because I believe I saved it. And now we can see some of the behind the scenes settings of the cameras. So we can set the SDI output type. I can set up some video feeds to stream from the computer here, from the camera here. I can go to the audio tab. This is really important. So make sure you enable your audio input. If you want audio to come from the camera down through the SDI line, or if you want to, I would highly recommend setting up a scratch mic. So when I got these, they were set to mic uh, terminal, mic or line. So I would recommend setting, getting a little eighth inch microphone and plugging it into the back of the camera, the eighth inch jack on the back of the camera, or uh, using the XLR inputs on the back of the camera, just uh, a line level from a mixing console or a mic level, if you just have a, micro a shotgun mic or something plugged in, but having audio, especially if you're recording a multi-view, having scratch audio from each camera makes it super easy to line things up in post. So would highly recommend that. And then movement range, um, movement limit. Oh, we can set a limit, that's cool. I'm guessing it's gonna bring up some stuff, yep. So you can set up an upper limit, a lower limit, a left limit, a right limit to make sure that the camera can only see so much, which is kind of nice actually, if you're doing an event and like there's no reason to see all the way over there. So you don't want the camera to accidentally go over there wasting time. So that's kind of cool. If I click on server, I can see some information about the HTTP video uh, content coming out of the camera. There's a bunch of networking settings and video settings and streaming settings. Uh, click on communication. I can again uh, check more networking data. I can change other settings like uh, DHCP and make it a manual set IP address to the camera. I can change the IPv6 settings. There's just all this stuff you can do and all these things you can wireless LAN. Can you actually connect this camera to a wireless? So you can create an access point and then you can control the camera through the access point that it created. That's really neat. Uh, you can also adjust some more networking stuff more serial networking stuff. Let's go to security and we can uh, set up information for the security of the camera. So there's just all these layers of control and management and you can set up the uh, accounts for the camera. So you can give uh, different access levels. You, so on the add-on settings, you can see that the auto tracking application is installing and running and working on this camera. You can delete it, that'd be crazy. Um, you can start up the auto looping feature and you can see all the settings and licensing for that. We can adjust the date and time, we can set the frame rate and under maintenance, we can see information about the camera, we can back up settings, we can update firmware and we can see the log for the system. Using the web page to control these cameras is less than ideal, especially with controlling the camera motion in Zoom. Presets can be saved and recalled, but with the introduction of Stream Deck controllers, we now have physical buttons to control the cameras using BitFocus Companion. Go check out the video where I look at replacing the Canon PTZ controllers with using BitFocus Companion and a Stream Deck to have buttons to control things. Because buttons are a massive step up from the web and computer interface. Thank you for watching this video. If you are looking to get PTZ cameras for your church, I'd highly recommend these Canon cameras. Send me an email if you'd like to talk about a system for your church, even to determine if these are a good fit for your environment. I have some other videos on the Canon PTZ cameras and a library that is only growing. Subscribe to follow along and I will see you in the next one. Bye.